I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1, if you would. <clears throat> verse 13. Actually, we'll go back up to verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, while the Lord, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I would like you to go then with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, for just a moment. Matthew chapter 4, it says, When Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And I'll stop right there. We tonight are human beings, which means we're flesh and blood. Every one of us was born of man. And you say, born of woman, yeah, but you were born of man, have a human father. And that lineage goes all the way back to Adam. And so we're the children of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And because Adam sinned, we're all sinners because we're his children. Romans 5.12 tells us that death had entered into the world by the sin of one man, and that one man was Adam. Therefore, we are all born in sin. Now, Romans 3.23 tells us that we have all sinned, and we continually come short of the glory of God. Continually. I, I'm not quoting the verse. I'm just telling you what I believe it's saying there. <clears throat> There's no way that I will ever be able in this life to be free from the possibility of sinning. That's right. Yet I'm able to choose to not sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. I have been set free. But yet temptation comes, and there are a couple of sources in each and every one of our lives where temptation comes from. The first source of temptation tonight that I want to deal with is the temptation from within. Where does sin come from? <clears throat> there are, again, two sources to sin that I believe we need to be aware of. I certainly need to be aware of it. The first source is from my great enemy, and, and that great enemy is my own self. Sin comes from self. I, I know we, we love, have a... Uh, desire maybe many times to blame it on other people <clears throat> but we need to look at this reality of the fact that sin comes from within very carefully now I have experienced new birth I have been made a new creature in Christ Jesus as it says in 2 Corinthians five seventeen. my sins are forgiven I now have eternal life as it tells me in 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12. I'm saved on my way to heaven, not because of me, but because of him and what he did for me. Right. Knowing all that, I still find myself being pulled out, being drawn away to sin. I find that saying I have no sin is lying to myself. In fact, as someone was talking about this, they were talking to someone who said they don't sin anymore. What they didn't say is that they don't sin any less. <laughs> you know, I, I, I met a lady years ago, and 
nice lady, and she said that she was fire baptized holiness and that she no longer sinned. I did not have the heart to say, you just did. You know, it just would have been too cruel at that point. But, I, you know, I've often thought of that statement, and, and I thought of First John that says, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. <laughs> we lie, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the reality of the fact that, that sin is still in me is demonstrated by the continual battle I have with it because of my flesh. <clears throat> 1 John 2.16 calls these urges that we have uh, a lust. I want you to turn there with me. Now, if, if you are free tonight, don't even bother to worry to listen, okay? It says in 1 John 2.16, boy, you know... I didn't want to go to 15, but now I just feel like I need to. <laughs> love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Well, I, I've got some serious news to reveal to you tonight. And I, I hope I say this properly. If I don't, don't get upset. Or, but I still got a whole bunch of the world in me, and it's called flesh. It's called flesh. Yeah. <clears throat> and so these urges, these lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they're, they're still part of my makeup as a human being. And it's important for me to know that one of the reasons <clears throat> that I, I have the Holy Spirit is related to this kind of temptation. Galatians 5.16 says, if I walk in the Spirit, I will not then carry out the lust of the flesh. If I walk in the Spirit. So the greatest guard to help me with temptation from within is to keep in step with what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach me and lead me to do. Amen. Now, so I've got this temptation from within. Does anybody here relate with me tonight about that very thing? Uh, my whole life, I have battled the battle of the bulge. Does anybody know why? My flesh likes food. My, I sometimes, I pick on Julie because she's my neighbor and she's my friend and she needs it. <laughs> but I, I pick on her about being picky over food. There's a part of me that wishes I were. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? She don't like mustard. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> she don't. There's a whole bunch of things, and I mean, I, and uh, and uh, I, I sometimes I think you went too far <laughs> to push her. But uh, honestly, sometimes I envy people like that. You know. To say, you know, I don't like bread. Wish I could say that. I don't like donuts. Wish I could say that. <laughs> my whole life, my problem is, I like everything. Where does that come from? Within. Within. My mother brought us up and trained us that you always clean your plate. I don't talk about the trash. No, you eat everything that's on your plate. I think she was trying to do a good thing. But you know, there's some times it'd be good to not do that. Right? 
and it's, I know you're, some of you are already, your minds are on this, you said, preacher, it's not the problem what's on your plate, it's the, what's on your plate the first time, the second time, the third time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm simply trying to relate to you tonight that there's a battle within. Okay? And it's, it's this old fleshly body. Then there's temptation from without. <clears throat> the temptation is, from without is from our strongest enemy, Satan. But not just Satan. Satan and his host of demons. <clears throat> and there's a progression in the development of sin as well as the continue to sin itself, and that's taught in Scripture. There, there, there is this thing that we, sin keeps progressing if we don't deal with it. Now, there are two main tempters in our life, and the first of these is our personal enemy. James 1.14 says that temptation comes from our own lust. Our own lust. Can we say that together? Our own lust. That's where it comes from. Why? Because we are shapen in iniquity, according to Psalm 51.5. And because we're shapen in iniquity, we're subject to sin. Paul said in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this, what? Body. This body. <clears throat> so these verses teach us that I'm my own worst enemy. When I'm tempted, I don't need the devil to tempt me. I've got the battle of my own. I have a nature that's prone to sin and in reality can only please itself. And I understand that I have all the, the seeds of sinning in myself. And I don't necessarily have to be assaulted by anyone else to be tempted to sin. James says that sin begins when I'm drawn away of my own lust. Mine. Sometimes we just need to take ownership, you know what I mean? So it's my own lust. <clears throat> but how does that the sin come about? Well, we need to look at the, the things in Scripture, and I want to take you back again to 1 John chapter 2. In, in 1 John 2, 16, so there are three things that can pull me away from walking in the Spirit and cause me to sin. The first one is called the lust of the flesh. When, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, how was this aspect of this applied to him? Well, let's look at it in Matthew chapter 4 again. Matthew chapter 4, in verses 2 and 3. It says, When he had fasted 40 days and nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Just do it now. Fulfill your flesh. You're hungry, Jesus. You've been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. I'm telling you, you're really hungry. Of course, Christ did not have, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, just stay with me, would you please? Christ did not have a sinful nature, so he could not be tempted in the same way that man is tempted. And I know some of you are already running that he was tempted in all manner as we are and yet without sin. Just stay with me. <clears throat> Christ's temptations were from the outside source. From Satan. You say, why couldn't he be tempted the same way we are? Lisa, do you have a dad? Is he a sinner? Yes. Jared, do you have a dad? Is he a sinner? You didn't have to be so anxious about that. <laughs> now the point I'm making is this. Every one of us were born 
in sin. Okay? Jesus was not. Was he? Didn't have a human father. But he had a human body which could be tempted. We know that because Adam and Eve were tempted. And they had perfect bodies. You and I have one liability above that. We got sin coursing through our bodies. Okay? So with Jesus, there had to be this outside source. Try not to think light of that because Satan is a pretty good adversary. But Satan appealed to the craving of his human nature. It, the desire to eat is not sin. Right. The desire to eat is actually a need. Right. When a baby is born, what is the one thing they need to desire to do? Eat. Right? That's not sin. To desire to eat two and three plates full, that might be sin. Right? Are you with me on this? So Satan appealed to the craving of his human nature <clears throat> because he was human. That was a very real craving. He needed to eat. He was a man. He was hungry. The Bible says so. And the craving of our sinful nature can get us into trouble with sin. What choices do we have? Much of this craving is related to a normal human need going awry. These may be legitimate needs, but fulfillment of them becomes illegitimate and sinful many times. <clears throat> Christ's need for food after fasting for 40 days was certainly legitimate, right? <clears throat> but food was not the supreme need of his sustenance. We talked a lot about what goes on today in the, the, the world of sexuality. It's not a sin, is it? But it can be. And it's within us. <clears throat> Jesus spoke his reply to Satan in verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Even the right thing in the wrong way is sin. Now the second source of temptation that John speaks of is the lust of the eyes. There in 1 John 2.16, <clears throat> he said, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the lust of the eyes, The eyes are involved in the temptation to sin, and it's through the eye gate that many evils are introduced into our lives. We live in a world today that majors big time on the eye gate. I'm not disavowing the ear gate, but the eye gate is huge today. This will sound weird to you. My friend Charles Elliott is blind. And sometimes I've said, you know, I kind of envy him. Does that sound crazy? <laughs> he goes through this world walking around seeing nothing. That's pretty amazing. 
He drives down the road. With, well, he doesn't drive. He rides down the road. He rides down the road with someone and he sees nothing. Because I said one time, do you just see darkness? No, nothing. You can't even wrap your mind around that. To see nothing. But his eyes, his person, are not being constantly abused and battered at by the things that are put before the eyes in the world we live in. <clears throat> you remember back in the garden? Adam and Eve weren't walking around seeing nothing. No, no. Eve looked at that tree. She looked at that fruit. It's almost the same thing as when a woman goes shopping. They look. <laughs> Men are not that way. <laughs> Unless they go to Cabela's or someplace like that. But she looked, and through the eye gate, she saw this fruit that God had said, you may not eat of it, but through the eye gate, she wanted it. Question, was it sin for that fruit to be there? Was it sin even for her to look at it? No. But looking at it caused her to what? Want it. A lesson learned. Sometimes there are things that looking at may cause us to want. So maybe what we ought to do is not look. Because we don't need the temptation, right? Look away. Sometimes on Sunday mornings, you come in, and somebody brings in donuts. And sometimes with the donuts, there are donuts that have a custard filling. with a chocolate frosting. Some of you are going, so what? I don't care. <laughs> there are others of us that are going, don't look. Walk away. Right? Because of the eyes. How did Satan use the eyes of Jesus? Matthew 4 and verse 8. It says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Of course, Jesus was not a sinner, so he was not drawn away by his own desires. But for us, it's better to not look than to try to deal with it. Don't look. I was driving down the road this week and I was listening to a, a, a Christian radio station. And uh, they had a guy on there they were interviewing that He'd written a book, and the book has to do with pornography. And he was talking about the battling with the eyes, you know, seeing things. And he, he, he said something that I found very interesting. He said, when, when, I'm, when I'm battling with my eyes, and of course, the eyes tend to work in the mind and the thoughts. 
He said, what I do is I start to sing a Christian hymn. He said, when I get through one, if I'm still struggling, I sing another one. And another one. And he said, I'm retraining my mind. That if I see something, I just start singing. Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you think if you sing, and Jesus loves me, this I know, it will have an effect upon whether you're doing evil up here? Mm -hmm. Huh? I thought, man, that's great. I like that. So the next time I see one of those donuts, I'll go, Jesus loves me, this I know. He don't want me to eat a donut today. <laughs> what did, wow, that, that was such great counsel to, you know, go to something else. <clears throat> the eyes, huge problem. Remember David? Yeah. Where was David's problem, folks? The eye gate, right? Walked over, looked down, saw a naked woman. He said, oh, naked women don't bother me. I've had people say that to me, and I say, you're lying, or you're not right. But you know what? David looked, and the eyes played an important part in his fall. Matthew 6, tells us that thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. <clears throat> You'll be able to see the things of the Lord and his holiness. The third source of temptation mentioned as a gate for sin is again in 1 John 2, 16. <clears throat> it says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The third is the pride of life. Pride is so very central to sinning and to the acknowledgement of sin. In Matthew 4, 6, Jesus experienced Satan tempting him to demonstrate who he was. You know, cast yourself down. Isn't it written, the angels will bear you? He was appealing to the pride. <clears throat> how, how can this simple thing be a part of the temptation of Jesus? How can it relate to the pride of life of who Jesus was? Because Jesus is a man. He's a man. James 4, 6 says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. <clears throat> you know, we, we need to realize who we are. And uh, I, was, I was just a sinner. I'm still struggling with that. But I, I was a sinner on my way to hell. When the Lord reached down and saved my soul. And... Uh, I don't have a whole lot to be proud of. But pride becomes a big problem with people. My wife, she always worries about me. She's trying to protect me all the time. And she'll say things to me. She said, you, you shouldn't say some of the things you say. What are people will think wrong thoughts about you? I go, well, I don't care. They want to think wrong thoughts. I guess they're going to think wrong thoughts. I honestly don't have to say anything for people to think wrong thoughts about me. I've been around long enough to know that. You know, I don't have to. <laughs> they just will. You know, the devil seems to cause that, you know. I mean, I, I can tell you over the years how many times I've been accused of things. I'm going, what? 
I don't know if I told you this one time, I went to a pastor's meeting and a pastor walked up to me and apologized to me and he said, I just need to apologize. And I said, why? He said, well, somebody said you were liberal and I believed them. I said, I said, what? Yeah, somebody said you were liberal, you were a liberal and I believed them. I said, brother, I've been called everything under the sun. But I have to tell you, liberal's not one of them. <laughs> he said, well, I know you're not liberal now. Now, I, I only tell you that to say, if, if you think that you have to be prideful and worried about, you know, somebody's going to call me something, hello, it's going to happen anyway. Just living and breathing. I don't have anything to be proud of, folks. I'm just me. Has anybody here figured that out yet? I'm just me. <coughs> you come to my house, you'll find the same guy there that you find here. Except when my sister-in-law's around. <laughs> I go into another mode. <laughs> Sin is a such a powerful thing in our lives. I'd like you to go to Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 17, if you would, for a moment. Proverbs 9 and verse 17. It says, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, that are guests are in the depths of hell. Now I know I just read a couple verses out of a context. But one of the mental processes that comes about when people move towards sin, and probably one of the first processes, is the anticipated feeling of pleasure. Pleasure. The Bible says in the last days men will be lovers of pleasure because their deeds are evil. Men, we're, we're, we're in that last day, lovers of pleasure. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there, there's this desire for pleasure that people have today. You and I battle this. We, we give into it. We experience it. Pleasure. And, and no, I, I don't really put a big uh, value on Discomfort. Uh, maybe I should, but I don't. But pleasure becomes a, like the holy grail that people are, are living for, they're, they're looking for, pleasure. <clears throat> in, in Hebrews 11, 25, it says, uh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, let's talk about Moses. Moses made a choice. You know, sin is enjoyable. <clears throat> As a rule, I think that's very clear. The anticipated pleasure involved in sin gets its grip on the thinking of a person. And in Moses' case, the, the pleasure of sin and its prospects were present but he chose to be identified with the slaves rather than the pleasure. And regardless of what it is, most sin has pleasure connected to it. <clears throat> but when you look at Hebrews 11.25 again, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. a season, just a little while. It's not like this is going to be forever, just for a little while, a season. We need to understand that when it comes to pleasure. It's not a... A, a, an ongoing thing. It's not an eternal thing. It's just for a season. 
for a little while. Is the price worth it? Is it worth the price? The second process in sin is rationalization for the behavior that's about to take place. That was true in Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. Lord said, Adam, what would you do this for? He said, well, it's like this. The woman. It really wasn't about me. It was the woman that thou gave me. I mean, really, I, you know, Lord, you, you have some blame in this. You know what I mean? You, you, have some you gave me this woman. Didn't you know about her? Well, the truth of the matter is, he took her from him. So the truth of the matter is, it's really who? Him. Right? But there's this rationalization. And we can all choose to rationalize. We can justify it. We can excuse it. We can change it to meet our reasons for our behavior even though we know it's wrong. We can figure out a way. But then, after we rationalize why it was okay or why it's okay and or blame it on somebody else and that's why it's okay. After we do that, then comes the third part. And Hebrews 3, 13. Too many pages at one time. It says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Pleasure. Oh. Well, that was costly pleasure. But, but, the reason I did that was because they made me do it. Or, it's not that bad. It's not so bad. But the next part is really bad. Because he said, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin says, I can sin and get away with it. But the Bible says if you do, you won't prosper. Right? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got enough money, preacher. What are you talking about? I'm okay. I didn't say money. I said prosper. I don't know how it is with you, but spiritually, I need to prosper. Amen. Spiritually. Money is a relative thing, honestly. Is it not? In this group tonight, there are people that have more money than other people. Isn't that true? Money is a relative thing. You say, well, I got more bills than they do. I'm sorry that you allowed maybe sin to come in and you made a bill that you shouldn't have made. I, I, maybe. I just talk. Right? But we all have some basic needs, right? Shelter, food, clothing. But yet there's different levels of income in this place. Prosper. What does prosper mean? To one guy, prosper means, oh, I need to make another million this year. To some people, prosper means, you know, if I could just make another $500 this year. It's not about money, folks. We need to prosper spiritually.
If I'm lacking in prosperity, when I continue in sin, it's an indication of sin's deceptive character, and it's an indication that I've gotten harder. Are you with me? That's the way sin is. It's deceptive. It's impossible to live in sin and not reap the consequences. It's impossible. God's word tells us in, in Galatians 6, 7, that whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap. Hosea 8, 7 says we reap the whirlwind because of sin. And being in, in a sin-induced whirlwind is not a light thing to experience. What are the things that come from sin? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 6, chastening. Every one of us here that's any kind of a parent have chastened our children. I find myself even threatening my grandkids to take this piece of leather off my waist. And I, and I tell my kids about it and they say, you should have done it. I, I kind of want them to say, let, get, just let me know and I'll take care of it. <laughs> you know. Chastening. 1 Timothy 4.2 talks about a seared conscience. We become insensitive to the sin itself. It becomes normal. And it means I'll just gradually get to the place that I say, well, I'll think now I can sin and get away with it. Oh, listen. Sin is a horrible thing, folks. It comes from within. It comes from without. The outside sin comes from Satan. The Bible says he's a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you're here tonight and you're a child of God, he wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. He wanted to destroy Jesus. We've got to learn to say no. We've got to realize sin for what it is. We need to realize that when we're drawn away of our own lust, tempted we need to deal with it we need to have the courage to step up and say wait a minute and when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you and says that's wrong don't do this don't go there we need to learn to be sensitive to spiritually listen and say okay I'm not going there but so many times we can become hardened to the point that we may not even hear the Spirit of God speaking to us. Because we got hard. Hardened sinners, my estimation, honestly, are horrible people. They don't care who they hurt, what they destroy, because everything becomes about what they want and what serves their pleasure. Sin. You got to struggle with it? That tells me you're alive. That tells me you're still in this world. Does the Holy Spirit bring conviction as you struggle with it? That's a good sign. It tells me you're saved. But just because you're saved, doesn't mean that you're somehow immune. You've got to deal with it and continue to deal with it. And maybe, just maybe, you just need to learn to sing a song or two. Amen? When the temptation comes, find something else to control your mind. And you know we can always Look away. Okay. Look away. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight. You love us so much. Father, you've bothered to write down in your word the things that we need to know to deal with sin. You showed us through the Lord Jesus 
You've shown us in 1 John. You've shown us in James. You've shown us in Romans. You've shown us in Psalms and Proverbs. Over and over, you've shown us how to deal with it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd help folks to deal with things. Lord, that you bring conviction that folks would deal with sin and not let it go on and let it grow into a source of hardness. Oh, Father, we'll thank you for what you do tonight. Thank you for what you are doing in my life and the life of every other child of God. Lord, just uh, tonight, may you receive the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this evening.